Well, it's been 24 hours since our federal government unveiled a major overhaul. Seven ministers are out, seven new ones are stepping in, and only eight remain in their roles. And there's a lot of movement in key portfolios. This is a complete reset by the looks of things, which is unheard of. I don't recall ever seeing a government, particularly as old as this government. This is eight years old, this government is now. Yeah. So to be going into this uh, with this massive change is significant. And it's coming at a significant time. We know times are challenging, but this is the team that is going to be able to continue the hard work rolling up their sleeves and delivering for Canadians from coast to coast to coast. And this is the cabinet Justin Trudeau will be taking into the next election. So this revamp, it counts for a lot. Now that we've had some time to absorb the changes, we want to break it down. Who's in, who's out, and what does it mean for a government that's been in power for almost a decade and with a brand in decline? Just yesterday, an abacus data poll showed the Liberals with just 28% of public support next to Pierre Polyev's Conservatives, with the lead at 38%. This has been one of the toughest stretches I've ever seen a government go through, right? Issue after issue, misstep after misstep, and they just can never get their footing. So I think for them, if you're going to have a cabinet shuffle, shuffle away, because I, I truly think it's hard to get in a much worse and darker position than you were prior to that kind of summer recess. The Prime Minister in the past has been, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say um, sentimental, but and I wouldn't say tomorrow's mercenary, because a lot of people got the chance to build their own narrative ahead of the uh, the shuffle that they're not running again. But there's obviously changes yeah. needed going into the next election. So to give you a visual of what the cabinet looked like before the shuffle, take a look at this. Now, it's pretty standard for a minister to announce during a shuffle period that they won't run again in the next election. And if they do announce it, they don't stay in cabinet. But of course, they stay on as MPs until they give up their seat. Now, before the shuffle happened, four ministers had already announced that they wouldn't be running again. So that's the transport minister, Omar al -Gabra. I've always known this job was temporary. And the question for me was, do I leave on my own terms or do I wait till it's forced upon me? And um, I decided that perhaps now is the time. Others include the mental health and addictions minister, Carolyn Bennett. Helen Jasek, Public Services and Procurement Minister, and Joyce Murray, Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. So that's four of the seven, leaving these three positions. Perhaps not surprisingly, Public Safety Minister Marco Mendicino has been removed. Rumors were circulating about this for weeks. There's been a lot of controversy in Mendicino's department, from gun control legislation to foreign interference. He also came under intense scrutiny when serial killer and rapist Paul Bernardo was transferred to a medium security prison in May. The public safety minister condemns the decision to move Paul Bernardo, but says he can't change it. President of the Treasury Board, Mona Fortier, has also been dropped. She's been in the role since 2021 and was responsible for negotiating a new contract with public servants in May. Yesterday, she tweeted that it had been an honor to serve in cabinet. Justice Minister David Lametti is also out. Lametti took over from former Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould in 2019. And there's speculation about why he's been dropped. I'm mystified, really, about why Lametti is gone. I think we're missing a piece of, of information here, either about maybe something in his life or in the file that would make sense for this move. As I said earlier, there are eight ministers who didn't change roles. Two of which are Melanie Jolie, Foreign Affairs Minister, and Christian Freeland, Deputy PM and Finance Minister. And that brings us to the new cabinet. The seven new ministers are Arif Arani, Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Soraya Martinez Ferrada is the new Minister of Tourism and Minister Responsible for the Economic Development Agency of Canada for Quebec Regions. Gary Ananda Sangari becomes Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. Terry Beach becomes Minister of Citizen Services. And that's a new file. Yaara Sachs, Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Jenna Suds, Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. Richie Valdez becomes Minister of Small Business. Now, for the big role changes among ministers. One of the biggest moves is Anita Anand, from Defense Minister to President of the Treasury Board. When you start hearing stuff like Anita Anand moving to an economic portfolio, I think what that signals to me is someone like Minister Freeland, who I don't question her competence, but I question her, her communication skills. You have someone who's likely much stronger communication through all her portfolios in Anand to kind of support her in that role. And moving into that defense role is Bill Blair, the former Emergency Preparedness Minister. 
He's a former police chief and will be Canada's point person at NATO. Dominic LeBlanc will now lead public safety, a big job with a tough portfolio that includes the Canadian Security Intelligence Service and the RCMP. Dominic LeBlanc lobbied for this job, that he wanted this job, that he uh, made the case to the Prime Minister and to his advisors that he could do intergovernmental affairs and public safety, uh, even though public safety is very, very challenging. Pablo Rodriguez becomes Transport Minister from Heritage, and Pascal Saint-Ange moved into that heritage role from sport. Mark Holland is moving from leader of the government in the House to Minister of Health, another big portfolio. And interestingly, Sean Fraser, the former Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship of Canada, becomes Minister of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. I think he got the headline promotion or certainly what the government would like the headline to be out of the shuffle. This is them really revamping that housing ministry, pairing it now with infrastructure. And this is a file that the government really wants to focus on. And we're told this shuffle has a lot to do with that. It comes at a pretty turbulent time for the economy. A lot of people are struggling with the cost of living and have been for a while. The Trudeau government has been in power for eight years, and it says this shakeup is meant to meaningfully address these issues. The question is, will it be enough? And does the public believe it's possible? <music> Catherine Cullen is the host of CBC's podcast, The House, and a senior reporter on Parliament Hill. She's obviously been following this very closely, and she joins us from her desk in Ottawa. Hi, Catherine. Hey, Lauren. Thanks for having me. So obviously some surprises here, some not so surprising moves. Walk us through this. What are we surprised about? What aren't we surprised about and why? I mean, I'd say the biggest surprise is how big this cabinet shuffle is, right? I mean, they, they really kind of like flipped the whole deck here. Only eight ministers kept their jobs out of the 38 in cabinet, 39 if you count the prime minister. So just the size of it that so many people are doing different things is pretty stunning. There's certainly a fair bit of new blood here. Seven people who haven't been ministers before. Uh, perhaps the most remarkable thing out of all of that is that we have a new justice minister who's never been a minister before, Ari Ferrani. Um, that is a pretty high profile job in the government of Canada. So to jump right up to justice, that was one of the big surprises uh, for me today. Now, certainly he's somebody with a background in constitutional law. He's got a really interesting biography. He actually took a couple years off, uh, and at one point for work, he went to Tanzania and worked on uh, the International War Crimes Tribunal there, actually prosecuting people who had been involved in, in genocide. So, like, a really interesting background, an interesting story. But it's kind of remarkable to give somebody new such a big job. In terms of the things that have moved around, it might be a little bit of a surprise for us. I'd say the biggest combination is uh, the decision to move Anita Anand out of defense, particularly in the midst of uh, Russia's war on Ukraine, and to put Bill Blair into that job. It's surprising that they would change in the midst of the conflict, but also because there's a lot going on in national defense. We're doing a defense policy review, uh, which might sound a bit snoozy, but it really ultimately is about what Canada is trying to do with the Department of Defense. You know, there are serious recruitment problems. They're working on culture change because of the uh, various concerns around harassment and whatnot in the military. So that is a really big job. Taking her out, she's going to be uh, president of, she is now uh, president of the, the Treasury Board, which, you know, like, I don't think the average Canadian could necessarily tell you what the president of the Treasury Board does. They're responsible for government purse strings. Um, so taking, you know, this sort of like star minister out into a lesser known portfolio and putting a former police chief in at National Defense in the midst of all these changes, that was a pretty big surprise for me, too. Yeah. So what would be the strategy behind that? I mean, are they grooming her for something? Interesting question. Um, you know, we have been hearing through our sources that perhaps she wanted something that was a little bit more domestic. There's a lot of travel involved in being defense minister. Um, also, there is a thought that amongst the liberals who have ambitions to maybe one day be prime minister, uh, Anita Anand is in that club. And maybe she feels that she needs to sort of beef up her economic uh, bona fides. So uh, a role like that would be a place where she could say she has a bit more experience uh, ministerially when it comes to the economic side of things. Um, as for Bill Blair, obviously, I think the government feels that his work as a former police chief in Toronto would really lend him to this role. 
But as I say, like, you know, you've got big shoes to fill in the sense that Anand had a lot of like strong relationships. She was doing a lot of work. He's taken on a lot of tasks. Uh, he was emergency preparedness minister. So he's been dealing with Canadian forces a lot. And we've seen, you know, post tropical storm Fiona, uh, the wildfires, the Canadian forces have helped out a lot with that. But this, uh, you know, this is, this is a big task for him and one of the more difficult jobs in government. Right. And as you said, this is a huge shuffle. And at a time, you know, when the Liberals have been taking a lot of heat for what's happening in the economy and housing. And eight years of doubling the cost of housing, his government is a failure. Do you think uh, this new strategy going forward, is this going to be enough to kind of quell some of that criticism? This, what we saw uh, on the day of the cabinet shuffle, I would actually... You know, usually journalists, we try to be a little bit careful, not too categorical. I want to say no. <laughs> this alone will not quell anybody's concerns, right? Because people are not worried about who is in cabinet. They are worried about, uh, you know, am I going to get rent evicted? Or uh, will I ever be able to buy a home? Am I going to be able to afford the cost of renewing my mortgage? Um, so I think that they took steps today. The government took steps to show that changes afoot, um, you know, that, that to, to sort of refresh things, but it's got to come along with some substantial action. I think they know that they're particularly vulnerable on the housing file, that that's something that a lot of people are feeling a lot of anxiety about acutely. They're also kind of being beaten over the head uh, by Pierre Polyev on the issue for months and months and months now. We have the fewest houses per capita in all of the G7. Under our government, housing was affordable. Under this government, it's eye-poppingly expensive. The government has to match this sense of refresh with, I think, a bit of a refresh in terms of, of purpose. It can't just be having different people talking about the same issues. I think they need to seem more seized with the priorities of Canadians. Right. And I mean, on foreign interference, on the RCMP, the Liberal brand has really taken a, a big hit over the last year so. Will this be able to salvage it in any way? I mean, we'll see. I do think they have to get refocused on uh, economic issues because that's where a lot of people are at. I think you talk about things that are interesting in this cabinet shuffle, um, making Dominic LeBlanc responsible not only for intergovernmental affairs, but also for public safety. Like, those are two thorny files, right? Intergovernmental affairs, you're dealing with premiers across the country, some of them not happy with the liberal government right now when it comes to things like the plan to fight climate change and... Uh, and um, carbon taxes and whatnot. Public safety, I mean, the previous minister, Marco Medicino, he was fired. We don't usually use language that's that clear and plain, but like he was fired. It's a hard portfolio. He struggled. There were certainly a number of missteps. So um, the Liberals have a lot of faith in Dominic LeBlanc. He's known the prime minister for a very long time. He's an old hand in politics and he's gotten them through some sticky situations. But like that is quite a mandate that he's got. I should say, though, at the end of the day, I mean, this is Justin Trudeau's government, right? The ministers are important, but it's really going to ultimately come from the prime minister, the decisions he makes and how he speaks to Canadians, because, of course, that is who people think about when they think about the government. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right, Catherine Cullen, thank you so much for joining us. Happy to do it. Thanks for having me.